Welcome to the Birth Abroad podcast. My name is Megan Jennings, and I'm honored to host mothers who have come here to share their overseas childbirth stories. From fertility journeys to postpartum and beyond, this podcast is meant to hold space for women all over the world to share their unique experiences with the challenge of becoming a mother away from one's home country. Let's get in today's episode. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today we have Lena Lundstedt on the show. She'll be sharing her pregnancy and birth stories from the perspective of a Swede in Argentina. She discusses how a couple rare conditions were discovered in her third trimester, which ultimately led to an unplanned cesarean delivery and a NICU stay for her baby boy, Augusto. Um, Everyone ends up healthy and happy in the end, so I will say that, but she discusses a really interesting situation they had in straddling public and private health care and how that really complicated the postpartum care for her and her baby. But I won't uh, give any more away. Let's just jump right in. Hey, Lena, and welcome to the Birth Abroad podcast. Thank you. (laughs) Before we get started, do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you currently live, who's in your family, and maybe even what you do for a living? Sure, yes. I'm from Sweden, but (laughs) I am uh, currently living in Argentina with my family, who is uh, my husband Jorge and my son Augusto. Okay, do you want to just start by briefly telling us how you found yourself living in Argentina and your decision to start a family with your husband? Yeah, sure. I uh, I was uh, working in Japan because I, me and my husband, we were both work with uh, computer animation. So we were both working a year abroad in Japan and it was supposed to be just that, a year, a year to just um, build up our portfolio, etc. And then we were going to go back to each of us had partners in our home countries and it was just going to be a quick back and forth. But we started to talk a lot when we were there. We were hanging out and we were getting along really well, became friends and then eventually (laughs) more than friends. And it all just escalated into this passionate romance that we felt like we couldn't uh, just give up on each other after a couple of months. So, So I just came here, which was very, just after four months, so it was a rash decision, but uh, but it has turned out fine, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> was that how long it took you to get your residence permit, just four months? No, certainly not. No, that was, uh, during my pregnancy, that was a big uh, thing that was still pending, so, but it is so much easier to be a foreigner here than it would have been in Sweden, because I could still be here. We just had to get out of the country and get back uh, every three months. So we would go on a little trip to Paraguay every three months, <laughs> or actually every six months, because I could also go and renew my permit at uh, at just a different city. So it was much easier than it would have been if he had come to Sweden instead. So you guys just had to go on vacation a lot, basically. <laughs> well, I, if only it was vacation, it was these 19-hour bus trips to Paraguay and back and forth, but yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like fun anyway, though. So was Augusto planned, or was he a special surprise? He was a mega surprise. We were actively trying to not have children, <laughs> very actively trying to not have children, just the... Uh, he happened to, I have no idea how he made it through, but he, he, he managed to become something anyway, even though we were on pills and condoms and whatever. He just wanted to exist, I suppose. He's a miracle then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So did you, did you guys talk about where you wanted to have him? Did, was, were you guys committed to staying in Argentina? Um, well, I, I mean, at first it seemed very scary to me to to stay in Argentina and have it and uh, in many ways it's uh, like it's a much poorer country there's not as much uh, access to the help and the guidance you can get in Sweden so that was a little frightening and also that because um, neither of us had this obra social which is uh, a way of uh, getting your medical bills paid by the state so it would be quite expensive as well to stay but the thing was that I would have to be away from my husband for so long in order to have the child in Sweden. It would, I mean, I would have to go a couple of months before he was born. And then after he was born, I would have to wait a couple of months before I could go back. And he 
could not get more than three months of a tourist visa to stay with us. So that seemed like it wasn't worth it. Yeah. So we cut that idea quite quickly. Did you know anything about what like the model of care was in Argentina or did you have to sort of quickly research that? Like, do they have midwives or is it more medicalized? What's it like out there? Yeah, like, uh, fortunately, I didn't know how it was anywhere. So everything would have been a surprise to me. I didn't know much (laughs) about how it is in Sweden either since it was my first child. But uh, also my sister-in-law had had a kid just a year before. So we had some kind of idea of uh, how things worked, etc. with that. And and our first contact with the uh, with the system was through her doctor, who was a gynecolog- gynecologist and a, a surgeon. So not at all with midwives, etc. that we have in Sweden. So that was a difference. That it was much more authoritarian. Like you, with a midwife, you have more of a or maybe that's just the cultural difference that is much more respect. And if the doctor tells you something, you're quiet and you obey rather than have a conversation about it the way I'm used to. So that was a bit of a difference there in the beginning, but not unpleasant. I wouldn't say it just, I did trust my doctor very much. So, but uh, I did feel like she would write little notes like you see in the fifties with this handwriting, <laughs> nothing, no computers or anything. Uh, so. It was uh, very traditional or Mm. Mm old-fashioned. So how was your pregnancy? It was very up and down. In the beginning, it was really, really horrible. I was uh, really scared and confused, and I couldn't eat anything. I, I didn't throw up, but I felt disgusted by everything. I felt disgusted by life, by myself, because everything felt wrong and terrible, and... And it was in, uh, since we're on the other side of the equator, it was in the middle of uh, June, July, which is the winter here. And we had no insulation. I was constantly cold and so fatigued. I was just laying in this bed. We had the blind shut day and night. It was like a strange, surreal nightmare. That first trimester was just really scary. And then I also had um, bleeding quite early on, which was, so we thought I had lost the kid. We were quite certain it was a miscarriage. Um, so we had to go in and have a really early ultrasound. And uh, we were convinced that, oh, well, it happened and now it's not happening. So that was scary. And that was a sort of indication that something was like he was fragile. And he was uh, not doing OK. Just this initial bleeding that frightened me. And I was so scared of chemicals and eating the wrong things and things like that in the beginning there. What what week did the bleed happen? I think we discovered the pregnancy in week six. So around week seven, I started bleeding. And then in eight weeks, we had the first scan. So it was really early, early and not something. They told me since he has a heartbeat, you shouldn't worry about it. But I guess it's something you worry about anyway, of course. Right. What was that moment like when you went in and got your ultrasound and you saw that the baby was there and OK? Was it a relief? Yeah, sure. I mean, initially it was a shock that I was pregnant at all. And we, I almost felt like, should we keep this baby? It was uh, strange. But, uh, well, abortion is illegal here. And also my husband said, of course, we're keeping it. So that we didn't think of that for very long. But it still didn't. I didn't feel connected as if, as if I had uh, wanted it and tried for it for a long time. So hearing that heartbeat for the first time and seeing this little blob that there was someone <laughs> else there, it was a very very strange and uh, it really made me connect with it much more. Aww. And so then how was your second trimester? Was it easier? Did things get better? Did you start feeling I a little was, more? I, I don't think I felt so good in my life. It was, <laughs> I was feeling so strong and like I was walking around, exercising and like eating well. Everything was much better. And, and then we started telling people as well. And people were happy. I was scared that they would be worried and stuff. But everyone was happy. And I was happy. And I felt like, fine, this is happening. It's going to be good. And both of us are doing great. We're going to grow to be a strong mama and baby and everything's going to be great. And yeah, it was much, much better in the second trimester, for sure. How, how far along were you when you told your parents? I think I was maybe 15 weeks, something like that, 17 okay. perhaps. 
And, and what were their responses, knowing that you were going to be going through pregnancy so far from them and having the baby so far from them? How did they feel about it? I, I thought that they would be upset or worried, but they were just happy. <laughs> they had me and my sister quite old, so they, they've been like really wanting to have grandchildren no matter what, kind of like before it's too late. So, so it uh, turned out to be uh, a happy surprise for them, oh. I think, and no matter what, somehow. They hadn't even, they hadn't met Jorge at the time. They had I told them, no, it was a, a stranger to them that I was having the child with, but they were happy anyway. That's how, oh, much that's how supportive they are. Yes, great parents. So let's go through your third trimester then. How did the end of your pregnancy go and then into the birth story? Uh, yeah, that was, uh, the, we were... Um, I think at 31 weeks, we were sent on an uh, extra ultrasound just to check, um, and like a routine somehow. And my mother-in-law said, well, let's make a 3D ultrasound. This might be my last franchise. Let's go and look at his face and see who he looks like, and I'll pay for it. It'll be fun. So we went and did that, and it was really fun. It was amazing to see his little face and like just to see that he looked like us and like well, he was a person and everything. But while he was doing this, scan you could see how the technician he just got really serious um so we could tell that something's not quite right <laughs> which is <laughs> the best feeling but i think that because we were also seeing that like he wasn't a monster or anything he was a cute baby in there so it was still some kind of happiness there but then he said you have a a lot of extra fluid in you and that is uh, not normal and it can be dangerous you should uh, not be walking around even you, you could your water could break that's how full of uh, liquid you are and also the umbilical cord it should normally have three um, vessels mm -hmm. and yours only has two vessels and that is a weird mal it, it usually doesn't mean anything but you should talk to your doctor about these two rarities so uh, um, at first I, I mean we didn't know what it meant that's all he told us so uh, we went back to our doctor and she said basically that she's prescribed me some medicine to keep the fluid in check and said that I should uh, walk no further than around the block basically uh, stop doing exercises stop doing everything and then and just take it easy for the rest of the pregnancy and uh, she didn't really tell us much more about these conditions but when we looked them up ourselves we realized that both are extremely rare they happen to less than one in 100 women and both are uh, can be random but when there's so much fluid that i had and also this umbilical cord it's usually has something to do with either some chromosome variation or other malformations of the fetus and the so we realized that something was probably not the way it should with the kid, that he had some sort of malformations or... So we got really shook up by that, of course. Did they offer to do any kind of testing to see if his chromosome profile was normal or did they just we tell had, you to... Yeah, we had uh, done that test initially. So we knew that we had like one in 4,000 chance of having a kid with Down syndrome okay. and I think they test for two other chromosome variations that are rare as well and they were extremely low but I guess I mean well it could be one of those one in the 4,000 perhaps right. I mean, uh, so we weren't sure uh, because these things the umbilical cord and the fluid they're not connected but both do point to something right, ha right. something happened early on in pregnancy obviously so we would we were googling and finding more and more horrible <laughs> stuff so he was like he's gonna be like oh he'll have four feet or like <laughs> all kinds of google is horrible <laughs> no I hate google. Idea. absolutely <laughs> Uh, it's like you can't help yourself but want to research and figure out what's going on. But then the second you learn anything, you wish you never researched in the in like the no, first place. Absolutely, you have, <laughs> have to really try and look in the website if it seems um, credible or not. If it's a scientific study, we try to look at those more and these other like madness ones that, that we Blog try to posts. avoid. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> forums and you know. Uh, 
but so we started to understand that we may not have a, a normal child mm. so we and it, I mean it's hard because it's not hard imagining that you will love your child no matter what we do that we knew we would give him a fine life as long as he wasn't in pain and it would be fine we thought but having a kid like that in Argentina is very different from having one in Sweden like I grew up with lots of children with chromosome differences or other uh, problems and it, it was uh, not something that would hinder them in life it, they would go on to have uh, jobs and apartments and they are not very different they just get the help they need mm. but here it's very different it's uh, if you have a child that is uh, special in that way they are basically kept out of society you keep them locked up because they are not welcome nothing is uh, you wheelchairs can't get up anywhere or if so there's very little understanding for that so that worried us definitely so, so are so there are no like social programs to help them like there are in sweden no they have special schools i think like the church helps out and sometimes and stuff like that and i mean since we have more money than most people here maybe we could find some private institution that but it's not it's very institutionalized it's not at all something that can coexist with uh, normal life in the same way as it can in Sweden. So that was scary. So at that point, did you guys have any conversations about, like, if if he was born with issues, would you move to Sweden um, just to get him that special care? or? Um, no, I think, well, as long as he was a baby, he was a baby, of course. So the, right. he had special needs no matter what, we figured. But... Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't something that we, we, I suppose we talked about if he needs something, if he needs special schooling and stuff, maybe we should consider going back to Sweden eventually when he starts school, when he gets bigger. If it's, of course, if it's, if he gets better health there, then that is what we'll do, of course. Mm. But uh, I don't think we, we didn't want to uh, jump to any conclusions. There was still the possibility that uh, there were minor problems or that there were no problems. So. Right. We just we just had this anxiety for the rest of the pregnancy. We didn't know what was wrong, but something was wrong. But we did get um, we were sent to a lot of um, tests, we did very thorough tests, and I'm very happy with uh, all the like special uh, care that we got after that. Like, we got to check his heart. We got to check a special ultrasound on the umbilical cord to make sure he was getting enough of uh, nutrients and. And we also checked uh, his stomach to see if there was a bubble, to see if his uh, intestines were okay. All of these things we got to do, and they were saying, it doesn't show anything, he might be fine, uh, there's nothing obviously wrong here, so don't worry too much. So we try not to get too hung up on it. One question that I'm actually really interested in that I like to ask people is, did you have any language barriers or problems communicating and understanding? Like for me, when I first moved here and had my first pregnancy, my Swedish was not up to speed. <laughs> and I live in such a small commune that the midwives actually didn't speak English well. So I always had to bring my husband along with me to every appointment I had just to make sure I understood what people were saying to me. Did you have a similar experience there or? Oh, definitely. No, I, I didn't speak Spanish when I came here. Uh, so, and I, I mean, my Spanish is still very, I think I can speak fine with a three-year-old niece here, but that's about it. So <laughs> that was a problem. Although I have to say that that, I mean, that, that must have been much harder for you with Swedish terms are so weird. It's like the most Viking words are within pregnancy. So, but here, since it's based on Latin, I would understand most words because they're the same as in English. So right. it's mm -hmm. all the same, uh, basically. So you, I understood most of it. And I understood my doctor pretty well. She spoke really slow and made sure I understood. And I always brought my husband anyway, just in case. I mean, I don't want to miss yeah. any details. So, uh, but I did feel like everyone tried to, because here it's not even that... Uh, I can speak English and they'll understand, but they'll be shy to answer in English. They just don't understand English at all. Really? So, not um, at all then, huh? No, no. I like teenagers might, like upper class teenagers might speak English, but nobody else. So 
So okay. that is uh, has been a problem for sure. That's definitely pushed me to learn the language. That's yeah, right. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, yeah. so you were at 31 weeks. They basically put you on bed rest. How long did that last for? When did you go into labor? What was that like? Uh, yeah, I went on bed rest, and uh, but then a couple of weeks in, I had this such a bad itching, and like the pregnancy itching, it can be fine or whatever but we went in and did a test turns out i have another weird uh, one in a hundred thing which is that my liver is apparently poisoning the baby oh my gosh is that uh, like cholestasis is that what it's called that might be it i don't know in english only yeah. in spanish but it's, it's terrible 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 itching oh. and i'm um, poisoning the baby so it was oh, on top of everything so I got more pills. I had this huge cocktail of pills and I was just laying in bed in the middle of summer, sweating, eating these pills, oh trying to get gosh, Lena, through it. Oh my gosh, Lena, I'm so sorry. No, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I had so many, what's it called, Braxton Hicks in English. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that started almost at 32 weeks or so and it was constantly throughout the pregnancy, the end of the pregnancy, these... Um, really uncomfortable construction so so I thought well I mean sometimes I would get so bad I thought well, is this is it is, is this how long I could do it but uh, that didn't happen I never went into labor instead uh, when I was about 37 weeks pregnant I noticed because I had had a really active baby I usually felt him kick a lot and then suddenly I stopped feeling him kicking uh, in the night Oh and he would be really active at night, so I was like, oh, no, 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 I like poured ice water, would shake it, jump around, see if I could get him to come back to us. And then I did eventually feel him uh, around midnight, I feel, felt him again, like moving around. Um, and the next morning we were going to go in for a check of the heart anyway, so we waited until then. And then when we came in in the morning, she was going to check on the movement, check on the heart rate. And uh, so she put all the gear on me and she was shaking and told me to push a little button every time I felt him move. But I felt him very, very little. And she was monitoring the heart and he was on a very, very low frequency. So she said, yeah, this is not good. Uh, They told me to eat breakfast, but I had had a couple of crackers and juice. And she said, that's not enough. You should have eaten more. But this is, uh, he's uh, not... He's not as active as he should be. You need to go and talk to your doctor about this. So we went down and talked to the doctor. And uh, she then said that um, this is so low. And because of all the other issues you have, we think we need to do a cesarean today, basically. So you go home and get your stuff, like take a shower and then come back to this other hospital where they have... um, where they have uh, an ICU because they didn't have it at the hospital where I was uh, supposed to give birth. Um, so we so we had to just go home, like change clothes, and then suddenly we were going to go and pick him out uh, much earlier than we expected. Um, so we, we got there and we got like we got to a fancy private hospital um, where I was going to give birth. It was basically like a uh, looks like those 1950s horror films where it looks like <laughs> oh, oh no uh, <laughs> I was fine with it. it I was I was ready for that so that was okay it was almost le- I, if I had been able to have like a good healthy pregnancy and a good healthy birth I would have been fine with giving birth in these kind of locations but instead we got to this really it wasn't cozy the way Swedish hospitals are cozy but at least there was like a little sofa for my husband to sit on and like um, we had a little toilet that was inside the room and stuff so it was nicer than it would have been otherwise but it was uh, just uh, the mood was much worse because we knew that the baby was so poorly and we didn't know what was wrong with him we just knew that it was this really um, uncertain thing with the child that we we didn't realize if he would live or what would happen that must have been so scary oh it was very scary but uh, i think that i it was uh, i think we both just pushed the feeling out like 
we just take this one step at a time, see what happens. I mean, if you go into it in your head, I mean, it just spirals and it's... Um, yep, yep. Just, uh, yeah, I, 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 at least I didn't uh, do that. I just, I'm just going to do what these people tell me. I'm just going to rely on these people. I felt I don't understand them. That's okay. I mean, <laughs> we're here together. So they want my best and they want the best for the baby. So that's okay. But uh, then it turned out that I was going to go down there to um, have the cesarean. And we didn't really get much information. Everything was very low. So no one really spoke to us. We had been waiting there. And this nurse comes in and just pulls off my pants and like shaves me down, oh um, which was oh, fine. <laughs> uh, but then uh, they start rolling me out and he, my husband comes with me and they say, no, no, you're supposed to stay here. And like, but she doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> we, I don't, we thought we could be together. And they say, and this is actually something I've read about that there is uh, they've recently changed the laws in Argentina so that you are allowed to have uh, one person with you when you give birth. But otherwise, it's very uh, strict. Like um, uh, they, they say, uh, I read some woman who had um, another Swedish woman who they were told she was told like, shut up, it doesn't hurt that much and things like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's very um, much more... Um, rough yeah, experience. yeah wait is it so, the same if is it the same if you had delivered vaginally that no one is allowed to be in the room just just you no this was they said that this was because of hygiene and he didn't okay. have scrubs right but he, okay. they could have told me us and he would have put on scrubs of course but no they just preferred him not to be there for hygienic reasons and uh, they changed a lot so that now the father is allowed to be there but he was not allowed to go with me, so they rolled me away on my own. And I didn't know. I mean, these women, they had a special accent as well, the nurses. So it was extra hard to understand what they were saying. But but I just figured, okay, fine. They're just going to take do it. Okay. So they rolled me down into this basement in this room. And there was all these people there. But it was also my doctor, so that felt okay. She's fine. She's here. She knows me. She knows everything. And uh, and it was really casual. Like she was, yeah, she, oh, she's from Sweden. And they asked me about oh, computers. Oh, what's that about? Like, and, <laughs> and I tried to explain that in Spanish while they're like putting the epidural in my back and like I'm just lay down here. We'll do this. Whoosh, whoosh. It was very strange that it was so casual in this moment that was this really strange, traumatic, absurd experience for me. But I guess for them it was another day at the office, of course. But but so before I knew it, I just they put me down with things. Some guy was talking to me. He was kept petting my cheeks, which annoyed me so much. I felt like, oh, I'm not a child. I can't speak to you. But I'm... And then all of a sudden I just heard heard the baby I heard him scream and I wasn't prepared for that I, I had read that sometimes with cesareans the baby doesn't scream uh, when they take him out so I figured right. he'll probably be quiet they need to clean him up and thing but I heard him cry and it it was so strange because I didn't I mean that was the first time he was outside of me like he was his own person and uh, he he cried this sort of whimpering cry, not at all like I had heard in movies, this sort of strong, healthy, furious scream that babies do. But it was more of a little sad whimper. And I just felt this really strong feeling that, no, 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 they, they're going to take it away. Uh, he needs to be with me. He's sad. I need to comfort him. Um, but they wouldn't, of course. They they They... They showed him to me, but I didn't wear my glasses. I didn't I mean, I saw a little blurry. They are well, cute. I don't know. And then they took him away. And, and I didn't know wh- where he was going, if he was healthy or not. And no one told me. They said he's he's beautiful, they said. But that's, uh, that's all they said. And I assumed that meant that he's okay. He's going to be healthy. He's fine. There was no extra tail, no extra limbs, no nothing <laughs> obvious, obviously. So I was... Uh, comforting I guess but also so strange and I, but uh, but then I didn't know uh, anything uh, they left me waiting with some nurses in the hallway and no one told me anything 
and it just felt like without care for me somehow. I don't know. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. Yep. Like all of a sudden you don't matter anymore. Now that the baby's out, it's the the attention is just on the baby, and and now you're no, just on, sure. on the table alone. <laughs> Which I understand, but it's uh, I wanted them to put the attention on him, of course, but uh, it was uh, very surreal. To, I was still a patient of this. I mean, I had a I had also had an operation and all, but but that they didn't uh, connect me with the, what was going on with the child. I thought it was strange, as if I wasn't part of it anymore. Uh-huh. I mean, I was still his mother. I felt, but that I wasn't acknowledged somehow or. Everyone said, oh, it's going to be fine, and, blah, blah. and uh, I knew that it wasn't, but they wouldn't tell me how. So that was maybe the most uh, traumatic bit that I was so suddenly disconnected from my baby like that. Uh, do, you feel like that up. do you feel like that impacted your ability to bond with him in those first days? Was there like a disconnect that lingered for a while or did it just did that moment just fade no no I don't think I've heard a lot of women feeling that with cesareans that they feel a disconnect but I didn't feel that at all I think that hearing him cry I felt instinctively that we belong together but uh, I felt a disconnect with uh, how we were treated that we I felt like we weren't treated as if we belonged but I felt very strongly that we belong together but that they had separated. I mean, it's it's physically we've been separated. I suppose it's it's a feeling that any woman would feel, perhaps, mm-hmm. uh, not just in this situation. Yeah. So, what's the recovery like after a cesarean in Argentina? Do they have sort of like a patient hotel where they send you to for a couple of days, or what? What's the procedure out there? Yeah, we had paid for this, uh, for the fancy room, so we, so we had paid for me to stay for a day, I think I was allowed to stay initially. Um, and then I did get like a painkiller in the night to be able to sleep, but it was so painful that I, I needed another one as well. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what we, they said, we're going to shake the baby, so what's, what's up with him, you go, home, you go up and sleep. And uh, my husband wasn't there. Like my um, my mother-in-law and an aunt of my um, husband, they came and they had seen the baby and say he's great, he's looking beautiful. Uh, they're shaking him. He's having some trouble uh, with um, uh, swallowing some so- some little water. Think that he might have still some fluid in his uh, system, but that's it. They're gonna shake him. Um, and then my husband came up and he said that he had held the baby. He got to walk with him to the to the neo and everything. So so that felt much better that family had been there and everything was uh, supposedly good. But then I didn't get I, I didn't get to see him anymore. I didn't get to hold him or anything. I just uh, they told me to sleep and tomorrow I would see the kid. Uh, so we tried to do that. I mean. So it was like uh, a whole day before you even got to hold him. No, no, there, that was weird because I, that's a very big thing in Sweden. This uh, skin to skin, immediate mm-hmm. skin to skin, is very important. They basically leave you to like care for your baby alone. It's very, very respected, and that was just ah, that's not that important. <laughs> so, so I, I hadn't looked at him. I hadn't touched him. Uh, everyone else in my husband's family had been there, seen him, but I hadn't yet. But I just figured, okay, I'll, I guess he also needs to rest. I'll, I'll see him tomorrow. So I tried to sleep there. Oh. So what was it like when you did first get to hold him? Oh, that's going to be a while until I get to hold him. I didn't get to hold him for weeks. Because oh, my gosh. Was, uh, yeah, no, definitely not. <laughs> I got to touch him. I got to touch his feet the next day. But uh, it turns out that he was born without an esophagus. And that's why he couldn't swallow. And oh, that was the mouth. Yeah, that's what was going on. That's what all these weird little signs was about. He didn't have a, a connection from the esophagus to the stomach. And also the stomach was instead connected to the windpipe. It's um, called esophagus atresia with uh, some oh, fistula. It's just called in Spanish esophagus atresia con fistula. It's uh, a much longer name in English, but I don't remember it now. But that uh, was why everything had uh, been so strange during my pregnancy. Okay. And it was obviously 
was obviously serious because if you can't swallow, you can't eat, you can't grow, and uh, he needed to have a major operation. We figured out quite soon there. Okay. So he was, uh, yeah. How how old was he when they did the operation? He, he he needed to have it as soon as possible, but this was one of those things that I think was very particular for Argentina. This bureaucracy that happened because we had. Uh, given birth at a private hospital um, and there was no uh, surgeon in our town that could do the surgery the one surgeon that could she was on the christmas holiday unfortunately <laughs> so so he couldn't do it so we would have to move the baby to a city that was four hours away which meant we needed to have an ambulance that could take an incubator and that would not have been a problem at all in sweden obviously where everything is the public care but here since this are parallel. There's the private and the public. And if we had been born in a public hospital, we would have been fine. Everything would have been uh, taken care of. But since we were, he was born in a private hospital, we need to get a private ambulance that could take an incubator. And there was all these, like, all my hospital room was just full of friends and relatives calling and doing like everything they could like this one knows someone who's in the local uh, medical board he's going to check with this one and then and we need to call some other one who's going to get some facts you know that is it was just a circus of craziness I, I couldn't really follow it myself but it was uh, really hard for us to get someone that could take him to the next city um, so that meant that we had to stay another day in this hospital where we were, where he did not get the care that he needed. He needed to get um, a different kind of care. He was mm. uh, getting sicker by the minute where we were, so it was very stressful and also strange. I don't, I, uh, that they couldn't like these people in charge. They just needed a signature from some guy, but he said, "Ah, it's not that important. We can he can go the next day." It was very, very um, Kafkaesque. This whole situation where uh. different forms, different people. No, this is public. This is private. They not they cannot collide. And also this hospital where we needed to take him. That was also a problem that we wanted to take him to a public hospital, but there were no beds in the public hospital. They were overcrowded. And to take him to a private hospital would uh, be extremely, <laughs> extremely expensive for us. So uh, we had to see if there was a public bed. And if since there wasn't, we had to find the cheapest possible private bed, which was also super expensive. It would, uh, But uh, eventually we did find one in a private hospital or a private clinic. So there was a bed ready in a private clinic. It would be expensive, but we needed to find an ambulance. It was just this mess of a bureaucracy around this. Uh, so it did, took an, uh, an additional day for us to finally get an ambulance that could take him. Was yeah. the hospital helping you to find the like a space in another hospital and, and the ambulance, or was it up to you to like charter this ambulance to come help? It was, I mean, the, of course, the doctors, and they felt sorry for us, so they tried to help us, but it was basically our responsibility. And it was something that uh, my husband's family took on. Like, I, there was so many people involved. I mean, I felt like I would have had to write, like, 50 thank you cards for everyone who had a little part in doing to get this ambulance to get him to this uh, other clinic. It was oh a gosh. huge circus. Oh my gosh! And meanwhile, you're trying to heal from major surgery. That's that's yeah. great. That's crazy that that it would be your responsibility to do all of that. Like, I wonder if there's any childbirth classes that teach you how to find <laughs> your own ambulance if there ends yeah. up being an issue. <laughs> yeah, I think that we it, again, it's the the problem was mainly that. We didn't have him in, in a public hospital to right. begin with. If right. we had had him in a public hospital, it would have been much easier. But also then we would have had to take from a public hospital to a private clinic and that would have clashed again. So I, I don't know exactly what, <sighs> why this happened or how it works. But eventually we got an ambulance at least. 
but then because I hadn't had the surgery, I was not allowed to go in the ambulance. I was supposed to stay put for five days and heal and eat potatoes. <laughs> um, so that was really, really difficult. Because uh, I had, so I walked down to say, to see him go into the ambulance at least. And it was, I don't know, I think um, there had been so many people, so many things going on. I hadn't really felt the impact of anything yet. And then when I saw, when I saw them rolling him into the ambulance by himself in this little incubator and he had this little, he had this little cords going in his nose and his mouth and, and I knew that he might die during this ambulance ride. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I haven't thought about this in a while. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Um, no, but uh, my husband was going to go with him, but I wasn't allowed to, and I knew that this might be the last time I see him. Um, and I couldn't go with them. Um, so, so that was when I completely just broke down. I was... I just fell to the ground like my family here had to help me like pick me up and they took care of me like I'm I'm so happy in a way that I that all of this horribleness happened here and not not in Sweden I know it would have been easier in many ways in Sweden but the support we had here from family I think is so culturally we would not have had in in my family in Sweden I don't think it's much more respected at all let's give them their space yeah. would be the reaction in Sweden but here everyone did come together everyone like my husband's grandmother would cook for me and like my mother-in-law would put me to bed like everyone just came and helped in any way they could and uh, aunts and uncles were looking into legal actions and looking into these different ways of just orchestrating this uh, move and everything it was it, really a big big family affair in the end were you close to those family members or did you did you know them or have relationships with them before this all happened i i knew some of them not well Uh, like some of these people that showed up during this time i'd never met before but i would hug them and cry and be like (laughs) (laughs) whatever if someone's here for us that's fine even if i I don't know them it's uh, it was uh, it didn't really matter too much that we weren't close or anything. It was just it was it was good mm. to have these people around. Yeah, and he did, of course, survive the ambulance ride. It was just the feeling of uh, saying goodbye. I didn't know if it was for good or not, but he did survive the ambulance ride, and he arrived in this other town with my husband. So it worked out. And he obviously received the care he needed because I I know the end of the story. I think. <laughs> just based off yes, of your yes. Instagram feed. <laughs> Great today. <laughs> Doing good. But it but was very scary. Was it just it like one surgery or was it multiple that he needed? I, I've never even heard of this con- condition before, so I don't even, I don't no, I feel like I don't know anything about it. Condition. Yeah, no, it's one in almost 4,000 babies are born with this. Uh, it's extremely rare and very random. They, they don't know why it happens or anything. It's just, just every now and then there's a baby who's born with this weird esophagus that doesn't connect. Huh. Uh, but it's it's a simple um, surgery, really. It's just um, they've been able to uh, save babies since the 1940s or something like that, I think. So the surgery in itself was not what was worrying us as much as the fact that he had this um, infection in his body and that made the surgery really dangerous because okay. the surgery would put uh, pressure on the infection so it, that could if the infection spread it could potentially kill him so so the surgery could uh, it was like a 50 50 chance if he would make it or not which okay. normally would be a maybe 90 percent chance of making it so so that was scary, but but I did go. I did. I didn't stay and ate potatoes here. I I went to the other city the next day because I felt. I mean, of course, I can't just sit here and wait it out. We right. we went anyway. So I was there when he was having surgery. Luckily. How old was he when he was finally discharged to go home? He was about a month old when oh, we wow. went home. Okay. So we were there for a while. That was a. We were in the new Nika for I think. 25 days, something like that. 
But that was also a very different experience, I think, from a Sweden in the Niku with the with how that was because um, I know from uh, listening to other people who have had uh, premature babies that it's you're very encouraged to be there to touch to be, but that was the same here. It was very focused on the baby needs this and you stay out of it. You're allowed to go in one hour a day, but that's it. And um, we were. My very, got very close to the other parents there because we were all in the same. Like, we had we were just sitting there waiting to see our baby for an hour. If we were allowed, sometimes they were like, "No, it's not good today. One of the babies is not feeling well. You have to go home." So we were just wait and wait. And so that was, I think, three weeks of that, just waiting, seeing how is he doing. They can call us in a minute if he's getting worse. We go in this hour. We look at him in this little spaceship with all these uh, cords, like things going into his body everywhere. Uh, and all these other parents with their little babies, some of them had been there much, much longer than us, of course. But, um, uh, it, was, uh, it was like um, you, it became your job, kind of, being there with these people. Right. Very. Did you feel like you had any control over the situation or or any way to advocate for yourself or your baby or or did they really just make you just sit and wait literally i i didn't have any say in anything they quickly realized she's not the one that speaks spanish we focus on the dad in this situation and, mm. and i was there because i was the mother but i did not have any say in, in anything that was happening but i mean i i just accepted that i just i knew that they were treating him well, that he was going to get better here, and, and he did get better. It was ups and downs, but... So while you guys are separated, and he's in the NICU, and you're recovering, of course, from your own surgery, were you even attempting to, like, pump and breastfeed or anything like that? Like, how did you navigate that whole part of postpartum? I, I started pumping about a week after I had given birth. Um, I thought I would fail because like it felt like this is too late to start this but uh, they said try to pump do it every three hours and then bring what you got and we'll start giving it to him once he once he had some kind of functioning tube going down his his esophagus he could uh, take milk and they said that we should then start to bring the breast milk okay so I started to pump and I got very little in the beginning like just a couple of milliliters but the uh, it, they mixed, they gave him formula and they gave my milk as well then. And eventually I, the supply got up a little bit and I could get like maybe a little jar a day for him. Um, but it was very little and it was more like a supplement to the formula he was given. Right. But then once he got strong enough to be taken out of his incubator, uh, he was put on the on the good side of the Niku, the, the healthier side where we were allowed to breastfeed. So. I would come there once uh, every day and we would try to make him breastfeed, but he wasn't really into it. He was really tired, of course. He mm-hmm. wasn't really doing much sucking, but we got some, like they said, massage his little jaw, try to <laughs> force him to <laughs> get into it. And sometimes he would do a little num num, like he would taste it a little bit. Or, and so we just kept it up like I pumped. And once he started to try and breastfeed, I got my supply up much more because uh, I guess the hormonal exchange between us made it uh, flow a little better. So I did get it up there. Yeah, I bet that's how it works. Yeah. Did your parents come and visit you or did anyone from here in Sweden come to be by your side also while you were going through this or how were they able to support you? No, I, I spoke to my mother every day. I, I would send her little messages about how, how Augusta was doing and things like that. Uh, but no, no one was uh, physically here with me. They wouldn't come until he was maybe three months old. They would come and visit my parents and my sister. Okay. But at the time when he was sick, it was uh, just a family here. Right. So based on that whole experience, would you have any advice to give to anyone listening who might be in Argentina also having kids? Like, is there anything that you would be able to tell someone else that might help them navigate a a similar situation? 
Uh, yes, I would say make sure that you stay within either just private or just uh, public care, preferably the public ones, since otherwise they're going to take all your money. <laughs> but uh, uh, if that is a possibility, that that is it's great care. It's just really, really uh, crowded in the public uh, health system. So, but if you can get uh, to have your chill child there, that's much better in the long run that will give it obra social automatically and things like that i think also because that's been a problem for us that he doesn't have this um, we have to pay for all of his medical care now as well when he's uh, a kid uh, so um, that would not have happened if he was born in that way that's a, a weird thing i don't know but that's <laughs> an <laughs> advice i can give and also to be uh, to be make sure that the that you make sure that uh, both of you can be there during the birth, that you need to maybe ask about that, make sure it's going to happen, because it's not something that's automatically assumed that the dad is there for the birth. You might have to actually say, well, I want this person to come with me, at least where I was. I mean, I'm a pretty small city. I think in Buenos Aires, things are very different. But, right. but still. Yes, it might, it might be good to double check that. Right. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share? Uh, no, that, I mean, from the stories, uh, I can say that Augustus is now doing great. He's having very few health problems at the moment, and it all turned out fine in the end. Wow. It sounds terrible, but it was it's fine in the end. Oh. Well, that's a great happy ending then to the story, right? Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Lena, for coming on to the podcast and sharing your story. I know it wasn't exactly the easiest of stories to share at times, but there certainly was a lot of really good information shared and really neat perspectives, especially when considering how sometimes it can be really beneficial to give birth abroad just based on how the family dynamic works um, in different cultures. Like in this instance, um, you had your whole partner's extended family coming together to help you out, which I think is a really beautiful testament to the positive sides and the positive aspects to giving birth abroad, not just how it can be difficult at times. So to the people who are listening, if you have a story you would like to share, whether it's a fertility journey abroad or pregnancy and birth stories or postpartum um, or any aspect of becoming a mother overseas, and you would like to share your story on the podcast, feel free to email me at thebirthabroadpodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, I look forward to bringing you all a new episode next week.